Hello and welcome back to MT3. Uh, in this session, we continue our exploration of uh, function spaces by looking at what do we mean by the adjoint of an operator, what is a self-adjoint, and what are Hermitian operators in these spaces. Now, in the, this particular recording, we'll be covering material from Riley Hobson and Benz, 17.2 to 17.3. Okay, so here's the primary question I want to address is, it's given an operator L, a linear operator L, how is uh, the adjoint, so L dagger, defined? Now, when we covered linear operators for finite dimensional vector spaces, I we defined uh, the L dagger to be the Hermitian conjugate or, uh, or the adjoint, here I'm going to make a distinction. L dagger is going to be the adjoint, and uh, there are specific conditions under which L is Hermitian, which we'll come to. So the very first question you should have at this point is, what is the linear operator in a function space? Now let's go back to the definition of a linear operator. Uh, L is considered to be a linear operator if it operates on a linear combination of uh, two functions in the space, so lambda times f plus mu times g, and if that uh, operation is equivalent or is equal to lambda times L operating on F plus mu times L operating on G. In other words, uh, if L operates on F gives you some, is a solution, which is in this uh, function space, L operates on G, you get another solution. If you add this linear combination of these solutions, you get the solution of L operating on linear combinations of these functions. So this is a direct, uh, uh, it follows from what we have done for normal vectors. Now, what this means, and I'd like you to show this, is that if I define L, for example, to be d by dx plus some scalar k, then this is a linear operator. And show it. Just show that L, this definition of L satisfies uh, this, uh, the definition here. However, if I define um, an operator Q, such that Q operates on F to be uh, the square of the first derivative of, e of f minus k times f cubed, for example, then this is non-linear. This uh, kind of an operator does not satisfy this condition up here. Okay. Uh, right. Let's go down. Um, now, what we're going to see, although we won't touch on it much in this session, is that the study of linear operators and function spaces leads to the study of differential equations. And we will want to find out how these operators act on functions to give us other kinds of functions. And uh, that will effectively be addressed in a different question. How do you solve a particular differential equation? But for now, let's just look at uh, what do we mean by the adjoint. Okay. Now here's the formal definition uh, of the adjoint on if you've got the inner product of f. Okay, so let me, the adjoint is defined as follows. For a linear operator L, if you take the integral, and this is just, just to remind you, this is the inner product on the left-hand side, so let's write this in red. So this would be written as the inner product of f with L operating on g. That's this thing over here. Now W, just uh, once again, as a reminder, W is the weight function. Which Riley calls rho. Alright, so we have a weight function here. This whole thing gives us the inner product in this particular function space we're working in. Uh, now, if you can, through some manipulations, which will typically involve integration by parts, and I'll show you how this is done, uh, if you can move the L, the operator L, from the G to the F, so here we have gone from, we move the L all the way to the F in some set, using some kinds of operations, uh, then, and if you put this resulting operator in under the parenthesis and uh, bring out the complex conjugate, which must uh, be present when you move any for anything on the bra side of the inner product, then this thing over here is called L dagger. So this is by definition what we call L dagger. Whatever arises when we move L to the other side, from the ket side to the bra side, 
that's going to be called L dagger. And uh, so effectively what we've done is write uh, this inner product as this inner product. Just compare this with what we've got here in the integral. And then what we are saying is that there will be, when you perform this movement, you will get some constant terms, which I will call the boundary terms. Okay, so this is a formal definition of what we mean by the adjoint. Now we can put down some uh, further definitions. So this defines the adjoint. And uh, if L is equal to L dagger, then L is self-adjoint. It's not Hermitian, not yet. It's self-adjoint. So that's the first of these important definitions. And in order for L to be Hermitian, we have one more condition. If L is, it's not that's a bad L, L is self-adjoint, And if the boundary terms so if there are certain conditions imposed such that these boundary terms vanish, then L is Hermitian. All right, so these are two important definitions. At the moment, they might seem a little abstract. So what the heck do you mean by this? What are the operations under which, uh, you know, uh, L is, how do you move L from one side to the other side? How do you, what are these boundary terms? But let's just accept these as definitions for the time being, and we'll now see how they actually work. Okay. Uh, now, having given you this, this definition, I'm going to say up front that these definitions are incomplete. And if I get time, I will show you why they are incomplete. But for the most part, for most of the stuff we're going to see in this course, this will be enough. All right, so let's move on and let's look at an example. That's the only way to learn, so let's have a look at an example. So we have an example. Let's define uh, a particular linear uh, operator, L. So we'll take L to be minus i d by dx. Now you should recognize this in quantum mechanics. The momentum operator is defined to be minus i h bar d by dx. So what we've got here is effectively the momentum operator with the h bar set to be 1. All right, and then you know from quantum mechanics, or you will know uh, once you look at, uh, once you've done a bit more, that we need to have the i in here. Now the minus sign is not crucial; it's a choice, but the i is essential. And uh, without the i, this operator will not be Hermitian. And this is what we're going to show here. All right, so what we want to show is uh, that under uh, certain conditions. First of all, we're going to show that L is self-adjoint, and then we're going to show that if the boundary terms vanish, and then we're going to establish some conditions under which they vanish, uh, then L will be, the operator L will be Hermitian. Okay, so first thing we want to do is the self-adjoint nature. Now, we need integration by parts here. So what we want to do effectively is to start from here, so take the inner product, And I want to transform it into this form. Plus some terms. Okay, this is what we want to aim for. Now what we can do to simplify matters is to choose the inner product. So use uh, F the inner product of f in g to be defined to be the integral a to b 
f star x g x d x i.e. that is we're going to set our weight function for this exercise to be one okay uh, do we have to no we don't but by setting it to be one we just make things a little bit easier to handle and uh, in most of quantum mechanics we do indeed have our weight, our weight function set to be one so let's see how we can start with this we start with the left hand side so f the inner product of f l g which written in integral form is the integral from a to b of f star x l operates on g of x with the parentheses is there to remind ourselves that l operates on g only dx okay now let's put in what l is that's the integral from a to b of f star x l is minus i d by dx g of x dx and now we want to move this operator from here to operate on f now the way you do it is used to use integration by parts so use integration by parts and this is something you're going to be you're going to need to use often when dealing with Hermitian operators which involve differentials so you need to get this down pat you need you need to know exactly how this works and this is this is uh, what we're going to be doing effectively on on uh, what we've got here is if I forget about the integral for the time being we've got an f star l g which is f star minus i d by dx g and what we want to do is to write this using integration by parts as I want to bring the operator to operate on the f so we have an i d by dx uh, f star g and then we will have the term we need to subtract off f star g now the way I remember this is and I hope you you do something similar is uh, d by dx of u times v is equal to u dv by dx plus v du by dx and use this formula to kind of figure out what it is you need to do to get this Finally, we can write this uh, down in because we need to bring the star outside the bracket. So we can write this first term as minus i d by dx of f star g. And this term can be written as, we don't have to change it, but it can be written as d by dx. So a perfect differential of minus i times f star g. Okay, now we can put in the integral sign. So put this, this, uh, this uh, these two terms under the integral sign, and that gives us, therefore, the left-hand side, which is f l g, is equal to the integral from a to b of minus i. Oops, I don't need that. D by dx f of x star g of x dx that's the first term and then we have plus the integral from a to b of this perfect differential minus i f star g dx now if you look at this what we have done is to write the first term in exactly the form we need so the first term would be is now in the form L dagger operating on F in a product with G and then we have this is where we get the boundary conditions from because if you integrate this because it's a perf perfect differential all we have is minus I F star G evaluated at A and B okay so what we see from here is that 
uh, L dagger, the Hermitian conjugate of L is defined to be minus I d by dx and that's equal to L. Therefore, L is self-adjoined. Great. Now what about, is L Hermitian? Well, for L to be Hermitian, these boundary terms have to vanish. Now the boundary terms, so let's change color. So the boundary terms are minus i f star g from a to b, which is minus i f star b, g of b minus, and then minus of the whole thing, so you get a plus sign, i f star a g a. Okay, so now if we impose boundary conditions, and this is something we need to do, so if we impose boundary conditions B, Cs, uh, such that F, such that these terms, effectively these terms should vanish. Right? Now, there are many ways in which, uh, am I gonna, let me see if I'm going to make a mistake here. Uh, one of the ways in which these terms can vanish is that we require these functions to be zero at the boundaries. So f of b is equal to g of b is equal to zero is equal to f of a is equal to g of a. That's one way in which uh, you can get uh, these terms to be, uh, the boundary terms to vanish. Now, if that does happen, then uh, what you're saying here is that the the eigenstates of the momentum operator are uh, zero at the boundaries, and 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 this in under these conditions. So then, L is Hermitian. But is this the only kind of boundary condition under which uh, L is Hermitian? This is one of the things we need to think about here. Let me pause this. All right, uh, back again. Um, what I wanted to check before, this is why I had this uh, short pause here, is are these boundary conditions even uh, needed? And it turns out that, and this is what we're going to show next, is that these are too restrictive. And what we can show is that there are far milder boundary conditions under which uh, this particular operator, the momentum operator, is Hermitian. This is kind of nice to have an exercise like this because, you know, mathematically, if you put too restrictive uh, a set of conditions, you may not even have a solution. Now, we know that these, uh, the eigen, and if you don't know it, well, we can show it by just solving a differential equation, which we'll come to soon. Uh, we know that the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator are functions of the form e to the i k x. Now, if you want these functions, these functions don't really go to zero. They are oscillatory functions. Now, if you want these functions to be zero at two points, it may just be that you force the functions to be zero everywhere. So, do we want that to happen? Well, the answer is we don't need to and we can have far restrictive, uh, far less restrictive uh, boundary, boundary conditions to keep the operator Hermitian. Let's see how this works. So what we need, so, so this is what we are after, less restrictive boundary conditions, all right? So what we, are, what we want to be zero, we want these boundary terms to be zero, and the boundary terms are given by minus i f star g evaluated at b from a to b. So 0 is equal to, this is what we need, minus i f star g evaluated from a to b, which is equal to minus i f star a, sorry, it's b, 
times g of b minus and minus plus i f star a g at a. Now this would be zero if if uh, you can cancel the i's if f star b times g of b is equal to f star a g of a. Okay, and what you can see here is that if, for example, you make the system periodic so that uh, f and g uh, are periodic at the boundary, so f, so so let's put this down, and this is one solution. Therefore, if f of a is equal to f of b, and since f and g must satisfy the same boundary conditions, so g of a is equal to g of b, then this condition will be satisfied and uh, and we will have L Hermitian. So, so if this is true, then the boundary terms will vanish. But is this the only condition? And it turns out there's an even less restrictive one. So here's the other case. Now what we want is we want this condition to be satisfied. What we can do is take this. I'm going to put it in red. Here, go back to black. If we can write this as f of b divided by f star. So it is a star there of a. That's equal to g of a divided by g of b. Now here we've got a function of f only and here it's g only. But f and g are arbitrary functions in this space. Therefore the only way this can hold is if these both these terms are equal to some kappa, where kappa is some scalar. Uh, further, so let's let's see what this where this leads. Therefore, g of a is equal to kappa g of b, and for the f we will get f star of b is equal to kappa f star of a. Now let's take this relation and write it in this kind of a form. Therefore. You can first take the complex conjugate uh, uh, of both sides. So what you'll get is f of b is equal to kappa star f of a. But I need to get it in this form. And the reason I would need to do that is because uh, we want all functions to satisfy the same boundary condition. So if this is the boundary condition, that g of a is kappa g of b, then I need to have this in the same form, which means I'll put the f of a on the left hand side is equal to 1 over kappa star let's write this properly kappa star f of b now if you compare this equation with this one here what we have this can only hold if therefore we must have kappa is equal to 1 over kappa star or kappa times kappa star is equal to 1. And if you solve this, then I'm the only solution, actually it has, a, it has an infinite number of solutions to this, and they are all of the form kappa is equal to e to the i theta, where theta is a real number. All right, so what we are then saying is that, therefore, uh, L hat is equal to I D by, there's a minus sign there, DX is Hermitian if the boundary conditions, if we use boundary conditions G of A is equal to e to the i t 
theta g of b and likewise for f. And these boundary conditions are called twisted boundary conditions. Okay, uh, now I haven't come across an example where we actually use um, uh, theta to be uh, other than zero or multiples of pi. Mostly what we end up doing is, um, is choosing theta to be zero, in which case we have periodic boundary conditions. But what you can see here is that they don't need to be periodic. You can introduce twists, much like you do when you, have, uh, when you construct a Mobius strip and I'm pretty sure that there must be an example where this kind of a twist is introduced physically and you get some interesting phenomena, but I haven't come across these yet. Okay, so this is how we can show that uh, a particular operator, in this case the momentum operator, is Hermitian. It's Hermitian. Uh, it's, it's always, it's, uh, we show that it's self-adjoint irrespective of what boundary conditions you have but it's Hermitian only if you apply a particular class of boundary conditions. In this case, these are the twisted boundary conditions, of which the periodic boundary conditions, where g of a is equal to g of b, is one special case. Okay? Now, there is an example in Riley, Hobson, and Benz. Let me go there. So if you go to Riley, Hobson, and Benz, here we are. And uh, what we have here is a uh, yes here. This is in section seven point seventeen point two, where you are required to show that the linear operator L is equal to d squared by dx squared is self adjoint. That's easy. You have to use integration by parts twice, and in fact the answer is down here, but please do it on your own. And then determine which boundary conditions do you need to make the operator Hermitian in the interval t naught to t naught plus capital T? Now, what I'd like you to do is to uh, approach this problem in the, you know, try and come up with the least restrictive boundary conditions you can think of. And uh, consider what that might mean practically. Okay, so the solution is, is kind of in here. Uh, Riley doesn't really talk about boundary conditions as much but there's a book here which does, although it's a bit advanced. Uh, this is the book by Michael Stone and Paul Goldbart. So I'm going to put it down in here. So it's Mathematics for Physics. And if you want to see, so anyone wanting to see more? So for more, see Stone and gold is it bart yes mathematics for physics this book is in our library as always and uh, it's, it's more of a graduate level text, so if you do uh, look into the book, I mean, just keep that in mind that it's, it's not meant for a first exposure to the topic. It's meant for those of you who have kind of gone through the material, uh, have found that it's not complete, you'd like to see what else is there, and then this is where this book becomes handy. Okay, so let's move on. This is one example of uh, how operators... Um, Okay, how how we how we um, form the adjoint, self-adjoint, uh, and Hermitian uh, and hermeticity and test the hermeticity of operators. Now let's see what are the relations from finite-dimensional vector spaces that actually hold once you're dealing with Hermitian operators. So if L is equal to L dagger and F of L operating on the inner product of F of with L operating on G is equal to the inner product of L operating on F with G and no boundary conditions. Oh, sorry, not more boundary conditions, no boundary terms.
that is L is Hermitian then what follows now why have I posed this question well in uh, in finite dimensional vector spaces when we came across a Hermitian operator what we had were various things so let's list them down we said that for Hermitian operators the eigenvalues so the eigenvalues are real to the eigenvectors in this case there will be eigenfunctions are orthonormal and three the eigenfunctions form a complete set now I'm going to put a question mark here because does this do these actually hold for uh, Hermitian operators in the function space that should be the, que the, the question we need to answer now. So let's start with the first one. So answer 1. Now, what is the eigenvalue problem for a function space, for operators in the function space? It's exactly the way we had formulated for finite dimensional vectors. F operates on, um, I'm going to call my eigenfunctions phi of x, and that gives me a lambda phi of of x. Now in general these phi's will take an index so let's put an index in there n n n. Okay so these lambdas are the eigenvalues and the phi are the eigenfunctions. The first thing we want to show is that the lambdas are real. Now how does that follow? Well let's see let's use the definition first we're going to do it at a very high level way and then we we'll look at it a little more detail okay so the high level way would be to start from here we have uh, we have this kind of a, a relation so let's consider the inner product of phi n with l operating on phi oops n well this is by definition, phi operates on uh, on uh, L operates on phi n to give us lambda n times phi n. So that would be phi n lambda n phi n. Now lambda n is a scalar; it's in the ket side of the inner product, so we can pull it out. That would be lambda n and the inner product of phi n with phi n. Okay, now we don't know what the center product is. We haven't said, uh, asked if these are normalized, but that's what we're going to do. But let's keep that for a while. Let's leave it like this. On the other hand, we can use the definition of, so this follows from the definition. Which definition is this? It's the one up here. Because L is Hermitian, uh, the inner product of F with L operating on G is the same as the inner product of, of L operating on F with G. So in other words, we can move the L operator to the ke to the brass side. So this would give us L operates on phi n in the brass side. This now once again, L operates on phi n to give us lambda n times phi n. But now we have a scalar lambda in the brass side of the inner product. We can pull it out, but when we pull it out, we get a complex conjugation. And then we are left with the inner product of phi n with itself. Now we must have these two sides being equal. So therefore, and now we can bring these two terms to the same side. We have 0 is equal to lambda n minus lambda n star times phi n, the inner product of phi n with itself. Now once again we use the same ideas we used in finite dimensional vector spaces. 
this is going to be greater than zero because the eigenfunctions, the phi n, are non-trivial. And what does non-trivial means? It means we don't include the zero function. I mean, to, to, to go back to it, this eigenvalue problem is always satisfied if phi n was the zero function. L operates on the zero function to give you any lambda, in fact, times the zero function. But we don't want that. It's, it's kind of the, the trivial solution. So phi n is not the zero function. I don't mean a matrix. Let's write it down here. Is not the zero function. So this must be greater than strictly greater than zero, which means we can divide by the inner product of phi n with phi n, and that gives us lambda n is equal to lambda n star. Therefore, lambda n is real for all n. Okay, so that's the first proof. And that followed exactly the way we had the proof for uh, finite dimensional vectors. Now, you might ask, if this is the way the proof follows, then surely all these results we had for finite dimensional vectors should hold for the infinite dimensional uh, functions that become vectors in this function space. And the answer is, in fact, yes. The eigenvalues are real. The eigenfunctions uh, will either be automatically orthonormal if the eigenvalues are different, or they can be made orthonormal using Gram-Schmidt if they happen to be degeneracies. It's harder to prove, however, that these, eigen, these uh, eigenfunctions form a complete set. And the reason it's harder to prove, in fact, we won't prove it here, we will simply assume it, is because we have an infinite set of functions. And when you have an infinite set of functions, so these uh, eigenfunctions here will span an infinite set. It could be a countable infinite set, that means these n's are integers, or it could be an un uncountable infinite set, in which case we have uh, a continuous spectrum in the terminology. Uh, let's not worry about this uncountable set at the, at the moment, but let's just keep in mind that there are an infinite number of these phi n's. Now, if there are an infinite number of phi n's, then when we construct our, our proofs, we have to then examine the convergence of all our series. We can't assume that series are going to converge. And this is what makes the proof of number three more difficult. Now, the proof is given in advanced text. It's not present in Riley's book or in the book by Arfkin, but you will find it in the book by uh, Stone and Goldbart. Okay, so the results hold, but the proofs may be different. Now, I'd like you to show that the eigenfunctions are orthonormal if the eigenvalues are different. So th number two, I'm going to leave it for you. And number three, we will assume. But before going further, let's just look at what's going on under the hood, in a way. We have looked at the algebra. We've used the algebra to make a proof. And in this case, the algebra was identical to what we used earlier on. But let's now look at the inner product in its uh, full glory and see if the same, you know, what's happening under the hood, so to speak. So I'm going to draw a line here. Right. And, OK, so in order to see what's happening under the hood, if we start with the uh, left-hand side, so we wanted to show we wanted to start with phi n, in the product of phi n, L times phi n. L operates on phi n. So we have here phi n, L phi n. And in, in integral form, this is the integral from A to B of phi n x, L operates on, oops, I keep writing a G, phi n x. And then we have the weight function. We have not been told what the weight function is in this particular case. OK, so that's the uh, expression there. And uh, what we know is that phi L operates on phi N to give us the integral from A to B of phi N star x 
lambda n phi n x with function dx. You can pull the lambda n out to give us integral a to b and the weight function. Now this thing here is simply the inner product of phi n with phi n. Okay, so that's the uh, that's this particular term and then we want to do the same with the alternative term. Remember these two are equal because of the definition of the because L is Hermitian. So I'm going to be a little bit faster here. So here we have L operates on phi n, phi n, and this is given by A to B. L operates on phi n of x star phi n of x w of x dx. This is equal to the integral a to b of lambda n phi n of x star phi n of x w of x dx. And now you can see what's going to happen. You pull the lambda uh, out. It becomes complex conjugated. And, uh, <coughs> and then you're left with the inner product of phi n with phi n. So this is equal to lambda star, lambda n star, phi n, the inner product of phi n with phi n. And the rest of the proof goes as before, because these two are equal, these two should be equal, and that leads to the result lambda n is real. Okay, so this is the long-winded form of the proof. This is the short algebraic form of the proof where you don't really you don't even have to specify what's the how is the inner product defined you don't need it all you need to know is what is the algebra the inner product follows and if that algebra is exactly the ones we have it's the same algebra we have used for finite dimensional vector spaces then the same algebraic relations are valid here and you sh you have essentially exactly the same proof and you can compare it to what you had earlier it's exactly the same proof for the infinite dimensional case as it was for the finite dimensional case. But when you uh, look at the you know, details, when you start to say this is what the inner product is, that's when you start to deviate from um, what, uh, how, you know, this is where the details of the inner product become uh, more relevant. Okay, and, and this is where you see differences between the proof in the, from the finite dimensional case to the infinite dimensional case. So I'll put an etc. here just to remind you that you do have to continue the proof. Okay, so now we have shown that uh, um, um, these. So we have we have now these three nice properties of the eigenvalues, eigenfunc and eigenfunctions of Hermitian operators, and that means what we can do is um, use these properties to make a basis set. So we're coming close to the end of the session. So let's just uh, see what this basis set is going to look like. The basis set will be the eigenfunctions of the Hermitian operator. But there are an infinite number of these. This is an infinite basis. That's fine. So any function in this space, f of x, will then be representable as an infinite sum of some constants a n actually I'm going to call it uh, I had wanted to change the labeling that's fine uh, I'm going to call it uh, a n not f phi n of x any any function will be representable in this basis now we haven't proved this we haven't proved that this is a, a basis but we're going to assume that that is the case and then you want if you wanted what are the a n's so to find out what the a n's are well let's let's uh, refine refine the space a little bit refine this basis what we can do is always construct uh, an orthonormal basis so just to remind ourselves what's an orthonormal basis
uh, these functions, because they are eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator, they will be uh, orthogonal. But we can also normalize them, so this is always possible. And for an orthonormal basis, phi n, the inner product of phi n with phi m will be equal to the Kronecker delta n m, which is equal to 0 unless n is equal to m. So let's work with this kind of a basis now. And now if you wanted to find out what the a n's were, well, you simply take the inner product of both sides with phi m. So the inner product. In fact, I'm going to drop the hats because we are going to deal with our basis sets will be assumed to be orthonormal. But let's keep the hats for the time being. Take the inner, inner product on both sides with phi m. And that will be the inner product with phi m here. And we've got this infinite sum. Now here's where things get a little bit uh, um, <laughs> even more a little, uh, vague or imprecise. It's always possible to bring the sum outside when you have a finite sum. So you can, the inner product of some function with an infinite sum would be with, with a sum, with a finite sum, would be equal to the sum of the linear combinations of the inner products. But when you have an infinite sum, you've got to ensure that this sum is convergent. And this is what we haven't shown. I'm going to assume that this sum is a convergent sum, in which case we can pull the sum out. And then we have an a n. The a n stays a n because it's in the ket side. So phi m phi n, but this is simply the Kronecker delta. So this then gives us and the Kronecker delta collapses the sum and sets and the only non-zero value will be the one for which n is equal to m. So this is simply a m. That's why we know what the a m's are and therefore f of x would be written as n is 0 to infinity. The a's are the inner products of phi n hat with f. And then we have phi n hat of x. OK? And this is something we're going to do. Uh, this kind of an expansion is what we're going to, what we're going to use pretty often. So let's give it a box there. It's identical in form to the expansions we used for finite vectors. Now one of the examples we're going to see next is uh, we're going to use a basis uh, of exponentials. And, these, and this basis of exponentials, we'll see, gives us a Fourier expansion for a function f. And the coefficients will be obtained using exactly these kinds of inner products. The inner product of each of the basis functions with the function gives us the coefficient in these expansions. All right, so let's stop here and just summarize what we've got. We've, I've taken you through a definition of what's the adjoint of an operator. Uh, what's, we've defined operators to be self-adjoint. If, if L is equal to L dagger, then we say L is self-adjoint. If in addition to L being equal to L dagger, if the boundary terms vanish, when you move L from the ket side to the bra side, then that operator L is called Hermitian. Hermitian operators are special in function spaces exactly in the way they are special in finite dimensional vector spaces. And uh, the eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator will be, up, have, we have shown them to be real. I have left it to you to prove that the eigen, uh, sorry, the eigenvalues are real. I have left it to you to prove that the eigenfunctions are um, orthonormal and we haven't proved I've taken it for granted that the eigenfunctions is these infinite eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator will be will form a complete basis for our space and therefore we can expand any function f of x in the space in terms of these this complete basis so we'll stop here